Okay, so we are honored to have him here and hope to learn a lot from him today. As Sadhguru would say, blissful. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having me here. Because I never went to a university, so you're getting me an entry. Namaskaram, Namaskaram, everyone. Namaste. Please. Good evening, Sadhguru. Uh, my name is Ayush Khar. I'm a second year MBA student here at IIM Bangalore. First question that I have for you is So, all of us here at IIM Bangalore, uh, we have been good at academics. That, that's how we made it uh, to this campus. And quite funny enough, we are often reminded as well, we are told and reminded that we are champs. Some, yeah. some of us were a state champs, champions. Oh, champions. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and some of us uh, were state level. State See, level. These are things you must say properly because chimps, you say. <laughs> I, I'm thinking what happened? Some evolutionary back step happened. You're a champion. All right. You've spoken a great deal about the, about the percentage difference in DNA between humans and chimps. Okay. But uh, so some of us were state toppers, somebody else was a national player. Uh, but the moment we land on campus, right, the system is designed in a way that only one would be a topper, the rest of us. We'll, we won't get that badge or get get to stand on that podium. A lot of us suffered our first academic setback on this campus. My question to you is, because the system is designed in such a way, how do we deal with that stress? Is this a common issue? <laughs> See, unfortunately, you didn't start this in this institution. From the day you went to your kindergarten school, people were always asking, are you first, second or third? Including your mother did not ask you, how are the other children doing? She asked you, are you first or not? So if you have to be first, every other child has to be below you. If others are doing worse than you, if that's the only pleasure you have in your life, it's a very bad way to live. Well, we managed to do a few things with little force because we're in a competitive mode. Competition means uh, your whole thing is about doing little better than somebody else. This is a very poor way to live because each individual, each human being have their own unexplored genius within themselves. The tragedy of humanity right now is over ninety percent of the human beings will pass through their entire life, they'll go to their grave without ever touching the innate qualities of what they're competent of, what they're capable of, what they could be. Because everybody's put through the same system, it's an extruder. When you come out, all of you should look the same. See, if you put something through an extruder machine, you're not a technical guy. You're a literature man <laughs> So, if you put something through an extruder, all the products should look same. One should shine little better than the other, that's a different matter. But see, when you went to school, they called it a nursery, right? Early on. Like at least you have seen plant nurseries. That means life needs nurture, not extrusion. Because every life is unique and it's a possibility. Does somebody have the patience and the commitment to explore that possibility? Unfortunately, we don't. Neither the parents, nor the teachers, nor most adults in the world have the necessary commitment to nurture an individual person to their highest possibility. Everybody's in a hurry. So we best put them through some system and come, come out, in some way you're useful in some job. So first of all, we must decide, where do we want to go? What is it that we want to do with our life? See, you're still young, probably this thought never came to you, but let me remind you, we were just talking about this when we were in that room. All of us are dying kind of life, are we? Hello? You're a dying kind or no? I'll bless you with a long life, but are you dying kind or are you immortal people? So what this means is, we have a limited amount of time. We can't control time. 
He's rolling for all of us. At the same pace, yes or no? Are we in talking terms or no? Yes. Is time rolling for all of us at the same pace? Yes. It's going away. As we sit here, we may think, oh, my clock is going like this. No. What's happening is my life is ticking away. Hmm? It is for every one of us. Maybe you have little more time than me, <laughs> but it's ticking away for all of us. So this limited amount of time, in some way, every human bo being, whatever their idea of life, they want to max it in some way. Some people want to eat maximum amount of food they can eat, some people want to have maximum pleasure they can have, some people want to earn maximum they can earn, some people want to know maximum things that they can know, whatever, but we want to max it, one way or the other. So to max it, somebody told you if you have education you can do it, so you're here, in a way, isn't it? If you get this kind of education, you can find maximum expression in the world. It's fine. I have nothing against it, but you should not forget why you're educating yourself. It's not like you shoot somewhere, wherever it hits. Let, can I tell you a story? Sure. This happened. Once Shankaran Pillai was in the United States and uh, he was there and things happening and then uh, his son, who was also in another part of United States, fell in love with an American girl, a white girl, and he married her. Shankaran Pillai said, this is it, finished. We are Indians, we must get an Indian girl. You married a white girl, I'm done with you. We're never going to see you again. So right there in the same country, but he never let him come to their home, nor did he go. But after three years, he heard that uh, they have a baby. Then his wife is having face time with a little baby and she is in ecstasy, the grandchild. So he put a rule, you cannot go and see their faces. That white baby I don't want to see. But one day a child is growing up. One day he just peeped and saw what he's like, oh my grandchild, he but you know, you can't let this happen. But the child is growing up, child became five years of age. Then slowly wife said to hell with you, you coming or not coming, I'm going. They're in Minnesota, I'm going right there. So he tried to stop her, but he also wants to go. Then both of them traveled. So they were living on a large farm, the son and his wife and the little boy, who is about six years of age now. Then he saw the son, everything changed. Maybe that evil white woman, it doesn't matter, but this is my DNA, you know? This is how it works in India, please know <laughs> So he fell in love with the grandson only, son and daughter-in-law grandson, total. So he was walking around with this little lively thing all around him and he is completely blown away. Then uh, this uh, little boy said, Grandpa, you want to see me? I can shoot an arrow really well. Come, I'll show you. So you took him into the barn. There he saw targets drawn in different places, everywhere the arrow is straight in the bullseye. Shankaran Pillai looked at this, what, you did this? He said, yes, Grandpa, from fifty meters, right in the dead bullseye, or right bullseye. Then immediately he started thinking, this is our DNA. We produced Arjuna's, Ekalavya's, <laughs> you know, the whole legacy what we have. Here it is finding expression in Minnesota. <laughs> then he looked at him with tears in his eyes, how do you do this? Grandpa, I first shoot and then write the torjet around it. <laughs> 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 
don't do this with your life <laughs> So, what is it that we want to do as a life? As a life, you want to become a full-fledged life. How is the question, isn't it? Do it whichever the way you want, but somehow you should become a full-blown life. What is a full-blown life? See, with every other piece of life, if you take a grasshopper or a frog or a tiger or a tree, we know what is a full-fledged mango tree, we know what is a full-fledged tiger, we know what is a full-fledged grasshopper, but we don't know what is a full-fledged human being. Hmm? Hello? We don't know what is a full-fledged human being. We do so many things and still you don't know whether you're really full-fledged or not because it looks like there's something more and something more and something more. Even if you're on your deathbed, still it looks like there is something more. Something else could have been done. But this struggle no other creature has. If you're born as a tiger, if you just eat good food, you'll become a good tiger. You're born as a human being, if you just eat well, you're not going to become a good human being. You educate yourself, you meditate, you pray, you go to temple, you mosque, church and whatever, you call all the gods in the universe, still you don't know what the hell is happening with you. Hello? Just about when you're thinking you're doing well, like you, young children grew up, they became teenagers and they told the parents, you are no good. <laughs> They've not told you yet, all the adults I'm asking. <laughs> They've told you. So, what is a full-fledged human being? Once you come as human, you must explore that, isn't it? You can't shoot somewhere, wherever it sticks, write a target and say, I did it. This is okay for a child. You cross that something. <laughs> Namaskaram, I'm Rimbal Doshi, second year MBA student. So Sadhguru, my question is about, I, along with a lot of my batchmates, have at some point thought about starting our own ventures, our own entrepreneurial journey. But with the stable jobs that we get with an MBA, the fat paychecks, it, uh, the entrepreneurial journey always comes with more risks, more uncertainties. So my question is, how do we know that we are mentally ready to take that switch to an unconventional job role? See, uh, it's not that you want to become an entrepreneur or you want to find a job, that's not how you should look at it. Do you want to make a living or do you want to make a life out of you? This is a question. If you want to make a living, just find something safe which will pay you enough. It's done, you get to eat, you have shelter, you have something to drive around, you have something to have fun, done. But there is something within you which troubles you, if you're conscious reasonably, unless weekends if you're getting intoxicated, you won't know. Otherwise, something troubles you when you're not doing what you can do. If you do not do what you cannot do, no problem. If you do not do what you can do, it's a disastrous life. So that disaster will always bother you. You willing to live with that bother or you want to address that? Should we address it? Why can't we just be happy with what we have? It's your choice. Happiness is not even the question because whether you are happy and unha or unhappy has got nothing to do with what's around you. People are committing suicide in palaces. Hello? Yes or no? In the last year, in 2021, 108,000 people committed suicide in, in, in United States. I hate to say this, but it's a fact because if… if they open up the visas for that country, for everybody in India, I think fifty percent of the people, even if they have to swim and go, they will swim and go. <laughs> you know, you heard of all these donkey flights and stuff, they're landing up somewhere in Venezuela and walking all the way up to climb the wall and get inside. Because whatever they're thinking they must have through their life, they could have right away, that's the idea. But in that place, 
over a lakh of people commit suicide per year. Most affluent nations are seeing the rise of suicides and mental illnesses. So somewhere your idea of a heaven is not working, all right? Because human experience is caused from within you. Joy or misery, both comes from within you. Now, what comes from within you, if you try to extract it from outside, we are turning the world upside down. For what? In search of human happiness and well-being. See, don't think some evil people are destroying the planet. No, no, no. It's good people in search of their well-being. We're turning it upside down. Now we see this planet is not enough, so we want to go to other planets and turn them upside down also. All this, if you want to turn, turn it upside down, it's your choice. I'm not against that. But you're doing it in search of your well-being, which will never happen that way. I'm concerned about the inefficiency, not the morality of it. There was a potato farmer. You know what's a potato farmer? So one day he suddenly got a desire to eat mangoes. He went in search of a mango tree, he found a good mango tree. And then out of sheer habit, he started digging, wanting to find mangoes. He dug and he found nothing, he became furious, so he dug furiously. After some time, the tree came down upon him. This is the human story on the planet. The question is not whether you're going to work here or you're going to start your own business or you're going to do something else. The important thing is, is there something that you want to contribute? Is there something that you think you can fill the gap? Because the world has so many gaps, right? Hello? Human life and the way human societies are structured, there are so many gaps. Suppose you saw a gap and you see that I can fill this, it's fine. But somebody is already filling it, you go and work for them. Don't make this a kind of a thing, am I an entrepreneur or am I going to work for a company? Address this in terms of, do you want to make a life out of this or are you interested in just making a living? That's a poor way to live. Uh, my name is Manisha and I'm a PhD to student at Anand Bangalore. So the question we had was uh, that uh, once we entered a preschool, uh, we had a lot of opportunities here in terms of clubs, events as well as job roles. So uh, sometimes it becomes really difficult to make choices. Uh, for instance, when uh, we see, like suppose if I have a job of a sort of consulting firm and I see my friends getting product management, to some extent we all experience the fear of missing out. So the question I had was that, uh, how do we make the right choices in life so that uh, we don't end up in this perennial state of fear of missing out? FOMO. <laughs> I, learned, I learned this word six years ago when I came here. <laughs> See, no matter what you're doing, you are not all over the cosmos, whatever you may be doing. So obviously you're always missing out something. You're not somewhere else in the cosmos, so you're missing out a supernova. How bad is that? <laughs> so I'm saying this is a psychological state. So please never misunderstand your psychological drama to be a reality. What's happening in your head, your psychological drama, yes or no? Is it happening anywhere else? No, you are making some drama happen. Maybe it's a mix of combination of uh, thoughts, emotions, opinions, prejudices and multiple things. But essentially it's your drama. Your drama, if you think is existentially true, then you will become a psychological case. You must understand, it's your drama. Whatever is happening in your head right now is your drama. Right now I'll ask you a simple question. Sitting here with your eyes closed, can you think of a tiger? Can you or not? Yes. Can you think of a flower? Yes. yes. Can you think of an ocean, mountain, anything you want, right? Anything you have seen and recorded, you can replay it in some way. Choice. But if you give up the choice and become compulsive, something is happening, you think it's because of somebody or something. No, no, no. It's your drama. This drama, 
The moment you are not the director, that's called madness. Different people are at different levels of socially accepted madness. Some are accepted. If it isn't, you are in accepted level of madness, you will be in this institution. If you cross that, there is another institution <laughs> close by. <laughs> so when I say accepted level of madness, suppose your two fingers, you have two fingers? Yeah. Suppose they start poking your eyeballs, what would she do? If she is concerned about you, she will hold your hand, why are you doing this? If it doesn't work, she'll call two more people and say, tie her up, because otherwise she'll pluck her eyeballs. That also doesn't work, what do we do? We take you to your doctor, maybe they sedate you, doesn't work, maybe we'll have to amputate you. This is the progression of life which is anyway happening to people. So right now, you are poking yourself with your own thoughts and you think it's got something to do with this institution and its options that they've offered <laughs> to you. No, no, you are just poking yourself. Why are you poking yourself? If I ask you a simple question, all of you, you can say yes, no or silence, but I'm going to bless you, it's up to you <laughs> Do you want your intellect to be sharp or blunt? Sharp. Oh, you ask for something sharp. So if we give something sharp in your hands, let's say I give you a very sharp knife, very sharp knife. Now you must be very conscious how you handle this and you must have a stable hand. Suppose you're a little la 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 la, <laughs> intestines will come out. This is happening to people every day. Their own thought is cutting them into pieces. Yes or no? Yes. Their own thoughts and emotions are cutting them into pieces, destroying them. Right now, one of the biggest concerns on the planet right now is mental health pandemic. We are working to mitigate this by creating a certain solution. If you're interested, we'll take you into that. This is called as miracle of mind. This mind is the greatest miracle we have on this planet. Do you agree with me? Yes. Human mind is the greatest miracle on this planet, what it can do. See, you look at a spacecraft and think it's fantastic. You look at a supercomputer, you think it's fantastic. You look at your own phone and you think it's fantastic. All these damn things are little drops out of this miracle, isn't it? Yes? yes. Small drops of this one. We don't know what this will come up with tomorrow. But this miracle for most human beings is a misery manufacturing machine. They're cutting themselves into pieces, using it against themselves. If your own fingers are plucking your eyeballs out, everybody here understands that you lost it. Yes or no? But if your own thoughts are poking you, unfortunately everybody thinks it's normal. Oh, she's stressed. You call it stress, you call it anxiety, you call it whatever. There are seventy-two names, seventy-two versions of mental ailments. Essentially, your intelligence has turned against you. If you remove half your brains, you will be fine, you will be peaceful. <laughs> the problem is your brain. You, you come from Hyderabad, you remember about five, four, five years ago, I think, one television anchor from Hyderabad city, who was a reasonably popular anchor, she jumped off the fifth floor window of her apartment and killed herself. And she left a note, nobody is responsible for my death, my brain is my enemy. To get your brain to this place, it took millions of years of research and development, which we are just dismissing with one word called evolution. But it's millions of years of trial and error, research and development that today your brain is in this level of competence and now your brain is your enemy. Who else is causing misery to you? Where is the manufacturing unit for all human misery? Bangalore? <laughs> oh, I mean Bengaluru <laughs> It's in your head, isn't it? So it doesn't matter what kind of miracle is given to you, 
you have learnt how to make a misery out of it. So essentially the problem is, in your education system right from your kindergarten, nor in your social structure unfortunately these days, nobody has told you how to hold this. Everybody is telling you how to conquer the damn world. Nobody is telling you how to hold this. The quality of your life depends on how you sit here right now. Not, not in terms of what you wear, what you have, what you parked in your bank, no. How joyful are you right now? This is the quality of your life. Ha! Huh, some things we do, some things we don't do in this life. If you try to do everything, you will become mad, hundred percent. FOMO is madness. This is because you're building things in your mind and believing it is true. See, if you build castles in the air and start believing it's true, we call this neurosis. If you start living in that castle, we call it psychosis. And the third person comes and collects rent for that castle, he's a psychiatrist. Don't do this to yourself. Among the institutions that we have in this country, you're among the best institution. Don't complain about a damn thing. I'm not saying everything is perfect in this place, there's no perfect damn place in the universe. Everywhere there are pluses and minuses. It's for you to either pick pluses or minuses. If you're thinking there's going to be a perfect place, you're going to die disappointed. There is no perfect place anywhere. How oh, we can strive to get it better, get it better, but we will never get it perfect because always something better can be done. That's the beauty of life. Always it can be done better than the way it's being done, isn't it? My next question. So my next question is about leadership. As leaders of tomorrow, we are well aware that we'll be dealing with a lot of stressful situations. Uh, why? <laughs> <laughs> Being at the top hierarchy, there'll be a lot of stressful situations, time deadlines that we'll have to meet. This might give rise to a lot of negative emotions as well, like unresolved anger, jealousy, greed. So as leaders, when people look up to us tomorrow, how do we deal with this negative emotions such that it doesn't hamper ours or also our team's performance? See, uh, in life there are many situations, situations and situations. Have you seen in the same given situation, one person is stressed, another person is breezing through joyfully, have you not seen any number of times? So no situation is stressful. A situation is simply there. It's for you to stress or not to stress. If your choice is you must stress, all the best. But why are you making such a choice? Is it something that you enjoy? No. Stress essentially means there's some friction happening within you. Friction is efficiency or inefficiency. In any machine, friction is efficiency or inefficiency. You're calling yourself a leader. Why are you looking for friction? It's inefficiency. Will we achieve some perfect level of efficiency ever? No, we are always striving. Always striving to get it better, get it better, get it better. But this is the nature of human intelligence and human existence. However you do it, there is a better way to do it. Still, isn't that the most beautiful thing? If there was a perfect way to do it, you did it and after that what the hell will you do with your life? It doesn't matter how you do it. Still there is a better way to do it, this keeps you going. Now, the moment you name a certain situation as stressful situation or another situation as a blissful situation, you will get enslaved to that blissful situation. Out of that you will breed cultures like, thank God it's Friday <laughs> What is happening on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, disgusting stuff is happening. Hello? 
in the West completely out of control, here you're trying to go there. <laughs> this is because if you enjoyed everything that you're doing, how can I enjoy everything that I'm doing, these people are doing this to me? See, you cannot enjoy anything for that matter. If you're joyful, whatever you do is pleasant <laughs> for yourself and everybody around you. If you're miserable, everything that you do is stressful. Have you noticed this? On a particular day, you're unhappy. Even smallest things that you do are very stressful. You're very happy, you're willing to bend backwards and walk. <laughs> yes or no? When you're very joyful, do you see you're so flexible, willing to do anything, running all over the place and doing things, you're a little unhappy, oh, we have to drag you around. So this is a choice that you have because people have made you misunderstand that happiness is something that you can pick from outside. There is pleasantness of experience and unpleasantness of experience. Let me put it in these two categories. Pleasantness means happiness, joy, uh, you know, blissfulness, ecstasy. Unpleasant means, means agony, misery, anger, frustration, whatever, whatever. You know the whole variety of things. You know by experience or just by study? He is a literature student, he studied about it, experienced also, okay. <laughs> so, let's look at it very… in a very fundamental way. See if this body becomes pleasant, we call this health. Do you want it? Okay, four people want it, others I'm going to bless them <laughs> This is a problem with you. The most important things that you need to make this life wonderful, you don't open your mouth and say yes. All kinds of things you will say. I'm asking you once again, health, you want it? Yes! Please, please say one big <laughs> Please say one big yes to yourself, not to me, to yourself because you must understand this, there is substantial science, medical science today, I won't go into it now, but there is substantial medical science to tell you, your very chemistry and all the micro uh, organisms which are within you, they are listening to you. So I asked, do you want help? They are listening, oh, this guy doesn't want, they heard. Please, this is very important that you make a clear choice because whatever the hell you're planning to do, at least you must be healthy, otherwise it's not going to happen. What ill health means is that your body becomes the prime focus of your life. If you're healthy, what it means is you can forget about the body and do what you want to do in this world. Yes? It's freedom versus bondage. The moment this becomes unhealthy, there'll be only one thing tending to this. It will not allow you to do anything. Health? Yes. If this becomes very pleasant, we call it pleasure. Yes. Hey, clearly tell me, huh? don't be shy about it. Yes? yes? If this man becomes pleasant, we call this peace. Yes. If it becomes very pleasant, we call it joy. If these emotions become pleasant, we call it love. Yes. If it becomes very pleasant, we call it compassion. Yes. If your surroundings become pleasant, we call it success. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so to create pleasantness of the body, pleasantness of the mind, pleasantness of the emotion and pleasantness of your energy which is called as blissfulness and ecstasy, all these are one hundred percent your business. Only to create pleasantness in the situation, you need the cooperation of so many people and so many forces. That is subject to various realities. But to keep this body pleasant, mind pleasant, emotion pleasant, energies pleasant is one hundred percent your business. So if you are blissed out right now, somebody creating, funny situations around you, 
what to do? <laughs> Every day they're doing these things around me, non-stop. You must understand this is a volunteer organization. <laughs> you know what that means? Nobody's qualified for the job that they're doing. They're enthusiastic but they don't know how the hell to do it. Yes, and at any time, without warning, they can drop it and walk away because somebody said something, not me. Somebody said something to somebody, they got stressed, they walk away. With this, how to run a global movement? Mm -hmm. So if anybody can get stressed and go crazy, it's me. <laughs> but that'll not happen because what happens within me, I've kept this privileges to myself. What happens within me, I decide. What has a, around me, everybody has a role. I try to push it, but they all have a role. Without their cooperation, outside things are not going to happen. So what happens within you, you must take this in your hands. That means there is no such thing as stressful situation and blissful situation. You are stressful or blissful, this is your choice. If you're blissful, every situation, what will you do? To the best of your ability, you handle. Your body and your mind, does it function best when you're blissful or stressful? Blissful. Yes, be that way because if you are stressful, even what you can do, you will not do. That means you will become a disaster. Don't do that to yourself, you're still young <laughs>… Uh, I want to talk to you about the idea of uh, detachment. So, yeah. What happened? I'd like to take you away from all the stress questions. Who is that girl? What did she do to you? <laughs> hey, he's a nice boy, be nice to him, huh? Uh, yeah, another kind of <laughs> Alright, uh, so <laughs> 50, 60 years back, especially in India, right? most of us, people would spend their lives in one village or one town. They would move, let's say, 20, 30 kilometers at night. But now, it's, it's almost an expectation of us. We don't settle down in our jobs, we don't settle down in our relationships. Um, and there's a, like I said, constant expectation to move around. Here also, so in a month's time, we'll get our degrees and the next day we'll be asked to move out of the camps. And, <laughs> yeah. But we can't say that we don't get attached to all of this, right? I mean, if I speak about myself, after eight years being out of my home, the hostel room that I have there is where I feel at home, right? So you… You like you the pillow? I'm sorry? You like the pillow? Uh, yeah, no. uh, but yeah, I'm just trying to get to the idea of attached. You do get attached to all these things and then it causes pain. So how, how do we stay detached to all these things? <coughs> wow. Say… Uh, the reason why you call it attachment, the better word for this is entanglement. You got entangled with your sweet pillow. Pillow only, not pillar <laughs> With anything, you sit on this chair for three days and after that you can't leave this. So this is happening because your involvement with li life is so constipated. It is only with this, this and this. You only involve yourself with what you think is mine. I'm going to ask you a simple question. Is this body yours? I think it is. <laughs> Tell me it's yours or not, otherwise we're going to act. Sorry? Tell me it's yours or not, otherwise we're going to act. <laughs> it's yours. How did you get this body? From where? Nothing that I did. <laughs> no, no. You were not born like this, am I right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> so, so what was this big body became this big how? Food that you ate. The food that you ate, where did it come from? From the planet. You ate from Mars or only here? <laughs> only here. So essentially, you're carrying a piece of the planet. It's soil, all right? Either if you realize now, 
you will do wonderful things with your life, or one day when they bury us, we'll all realize. Then it's of no use to you, but it's good for the world, you make good manure. All human beings, however good or nasty they are, they make good manure. Yes? Everybody. So without exception, we will be good to the world when we are dead. But the important thing is, now how this life happens. So it is true that this body you gathered from the soil. So, is the planet also yours, I'm asking? Well, I'm a part of it, yes. No, no, is it yours, I'm asking? Yes. It's yours. Yes. The solar system is yours. <laughs> Sadhguru, so, there's only one correct answer and I assume Huh? There's only one correct answer here, I assume. What is that? I'm saying there's only one correct answer here, I assume. What is that? Uh, I, think, I think… I think I should say no. <laughs> you can say whatever. See, w uh, this is not some kind of an argument. We're just exploring something because never see a question in your life, do one thing. A question is a very precious thing, don't waste it. Question is a tool to dig a little deeper. Question is not about proving that you're smarter than somebody. If you don't use the question to dig deeper, you will never go deep enough in your life. Every question that you ask, see if it is going to take you to a little more profound understanding of what's happening around you. Right now, is it true you're ca carrying a piece of the planet and you're calling it mine? Yes. Yes. How many places fr fr from where it came, you do not know. As you're breathing, from how many places this air is coming, you do not know. So I'm asking, is this planet yours? Yes. It's yours. This planet cannot exist in isolation. It has to have a system which we call a solar system. Is that yours, I'm asking? Yes. Yes. So your involvement, unfortunately, is very prejudiced. What you think is yours, only with that we are involved, rest you're uninvolved. See, if you see your friend, he he he, if you see somebody of because of this you suffer and you must. Because of very constipated involvement with life, you get entangled. With everything that you touch, you'll get entangled. If your in involvement was indiscriminate, because you breathe, whatever comes from anywhere you're breathing, right? Your body has no discrimination. Here, there is a man or a woman sitting here who is your enemy. What they exhale, you inhale, your body has no problem. But if you look at them, then your mind will resist, it doesn't want to breathe. So this prejudice is what you're suffering. You calling it some spiritual stir nonsense that you say, this is attachment, this is detachment. Unfortunately, everybody is accusing Krishna of talking about detachment, look at his life. He is a man of involvement, yes or no? Hello? Whatever little you know about his story, does it spell involvement or detachment? Please tell me. Involvement, super involvement. So your involvement need not be in terms of, will I get something out of this or not? Your involvement is with everything, but your engagement you choose. I'm involved with everything, but right now I'm talking to you. My engagement is with, with you, my involvement is with everything. Does it cost you something? For you to be involved with everything around you, does it cost you something? Engagement will demand time and energy. That we have to spend judiciously because we already went through this, we have a limited amount of time and we have a limited amount of energy. So that has to be conducted judiciously. Engagement is always judicious. Involvement. Why are you not involved with the sun which fires your life? You're a solar-powered life, you know that. Everything here is, but why, are you, why is it not yours? It is yours and you belong to it also, both ways. So human involvement, if you restrain, you will get entangled. Don't give spiritual nonsense to it, you're just entangled. But life situations will try to release you in so many ways. Can I tell you one more story? Sure, this happened. Shankaran Pillai was living in the United States. He was married to a, a white American woman himself this time. <laughs> and then one day, both of them were golfers, 
They went out golfing and they came home, they had a... wife had a little bad golf day. She came home and she was little like that, emotional. She came home, they sat together, had dinner. Then she said, suppose I die one day, will you marry someone else? Shankaran Pillai, no trouble is coming, but you don't know from which way it's coming. You know? <laughs> you know it's coming, but you don't know from where, how it's going to come. So he said, uh, yes, suppose I'm alone, what am I supposed to do? Yes, I will get married, what else to do? Oh, both of you will live in this house. What else? This is my, our house, where else will I live? I will live here. Both of you will sleep in the same bedroom. <laughs> where else can we sleep in the bathroom? <laughs> we will have to sleep in the bedroom, what else can we do? Then she said, will you let her use my golf clubs? He said, no, she's left-handed. <laughs> Life will detach you <laughs> many times. If you're getting too attached, it will release you, don't worry. But don't wait for life to teach you a lesson, because life will teach you lessons in many hard ways. It's best, being a human being, you're conscious, you don't have to go through what everybody goes through. Sitting here, all the lessons that people did not learn in last ten generations, you can learn right now, sitting here in ten minutes. Yes or no, if you're willing. If you keep yourself conscious, conscious and alert to what's happening within you, you in, in ten minutes or an hour's time, you can figure out all the things that your parents and their parents and their… your ancestors struggled with. You can come to a place where you don't struggle with those things anymore. Possible or no? Please do it. <laughs> um, we are back to these two questions. So, um, what question? <laughs> MBA questions. <laughs> so, um, Sadhguru, we often find ourselves uh, prioritizing our work and ourselves over people who truly care for us sometimes. Uh, some of us don't find the time to reply to our friends who are outside campus or attend some family events. So, uh, this often comes with a lot of guilt. So, do you think it's justifiable to lead life like this? Your friends and family, I think they'll be only happy if you do well with whatever the hell you're doing. If you are sitting here and continuously messaging them and flunked your examination, I don't think your parents will be happy and then you tell them I flunked because I was messaging you all the time. That'll be insult to injury, don't do that. You're here for a certain purpose, fulfill that. Social nonsense we do to the extent it allows anywhere, huh? Because uh, I don't want to bring my own example, I'm terrible with social stuff because I made friends in millions, more than friends, they would be like family or much more. So everybody thinks I'm not doing well enough for them, just everybody. Nobody is happy with me because I'm not able to spend the time that I'm supposed to spend with them. I would like to spend with them. But if I start doing that, what I do will shrink. Tell me what, we sh what should we do? No, it's important, you do your best. It's not about how much time you spend with your family and friends. One moment of a deep sense of involvement is good enough. Next two years if you don't see them, five years if you don't see them, it's still okay because people cherish that, not continuous stupid messages that are going. Cool. Um, another thing that the students here uh, will relate with, all of us were chasing one exam after the other. We have been chasing one exam after the other throughout our lives. In fact, some of us took the entrance exam to IIM or to the IIM stat multiple times to You passed that one? Oh, <laughs> my <laughs> But uh, even on campus, right, uh, during, uh, while living on campus, I've seen people doing the CFA, somebody's taking the FRM, somebody's chasing case competitions. So we have been, they've all, like I said, they've all been chasing one exam after the other. 
but in a month's time, half of the campus will move out and we'll be grown-ups, suddenly. And <laughs> Oh, you are admitting that also <laughs> And uh, will we expect… So, the question is, how do we find a purpose in this no exam paradigm that we'll be in uh, once we move out of the campus? Oh, you're going to miss it, that's what it is. <laughs> I've, I've so I've what you what you have been struggling with, you're going to miss it. Um, no, I I won't miss it. But then the idea is, too many of us are used to uh, this paradigm, right? Chasing one exam after the other, one thing after something after one after the other. Right? Once we boom out, move out, we won't have anything to look forward to ex except for our jobs, right? We have, we do have our jobs, and it does give us a sense of purpose. But if we are really looking, to, like say accomplish something larger uh, in life, how do we do that once we walk out of campus? See, when examination is approaching, you're not bursting with joy to find expression to all the knowledge you have. <laughs> yes. No. Yeah. But if there is no exam, you're going to miss it. <laughs> like I said, uh, the structure that we've been so used to… I, I got… I got the drift. <laughs> But I won't miss it, yeah, I won't miss it. You, you're inspiring me to tell you more and more stories. The girls are not asking for stories <laughs> <laughs> This happened. One day Shankaran Pillai had a gala fight, gala fight with his wife. See, these things may happen. He had a gala fight with his wife and in… late in the evening, he not able to bear the fight because the… the debate at home normally he loses and he can't come to terms with it, so he walked away. Enough of this, I walked away. Whole night he loitered all around, early morning, 5.30, some breakfast place opened. He went there. Uh, the server came and, Namaskaram, sir, what do you want? He's in full spirit. But Shankaran Pillai is like this. He said, I want cold and hard idlis. I want sambar with excess salt. And I want a coffee which is weak and cold. Sir, why sir? Why? Flower like soft idlis, wonderful sambar, hot and strong coffee I can serve you. Sir, you idiot, you think I've come here because I'm hungry? I'm missing home. <laughs> We'll do a few audience questions. Namaste Sadhguru, I'm blessed to see you on my 21st birthday, that's oh, today. Okay. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and I'd like to ask you if uh, cinema could be a medium for uh, spiritual exploration. So cinema, as it goes, is one of the most powerful mediums even today, most impactful. Why is it television not as impactful as cinema? Because in cinema the biggest advantage is the lights are off. You do one thing, turn on the lights and watch the cinema, the best movie, no impact. The lights are off, suddenly it's a big deal. It becomes more real than real life. People who are in the cinema, uh, those who have never seen them in their life, they love them. They're living entities in their homes, all right? Because lights were off and everything boom, big. So this all it takes in your life also. If lights are off for other things and you pay attention to something, suddenly that will explode. But most people don't have that kind of attention in their life. Especially today, people are carrying attention deficiency as a kind of a badge on their shoulders. So you must understand this, nothing in this universe yields to you unless you pay enough attention, keen enough, strong enough attention, nothing yields to you. You will remain on the surface of life if your attention is not very keen. So how to bring attention? There are many methods, let's not go into it, but cinema does this to people because lights are off, there is no choice, boom, it's all there. So the impact of cinema is very big, should it be used? Anything that you think is important, 
anything that you think is important, whether it's health, well-being, environment, spiritual process, whatever you think is in… or even politics, you think it's important for the well-being of human beings, you must make a cinema on that because cinema has such tremendous impact on people. So, sometimes it, it happens that we are… although we are blissful from the inside, when we start thinking about our long-term plans, those plans gradually they, they change into overthinking and then they, the situation turns stressful. That leads to procrastination. So, how do we know where to draw the boundary that, okay, now this is going into the overthinking territory <laughs> and I should draw a line? See, uh, I'm seeing these days lot of young people are using this term, Sadhguru, how to stop overthinking? There is no such thing as overthinking. I think human beings are not thinking enough. <laughs> what is overthinking? Human brain is made in such a way you can sit here and think about one hundred things at the same time. But right now people are teaching you think one thing at a time. Oh, you should have been an earthworm. It's very… don't laugh, it's very eco-friendly. Or maybe you could have been a frog, you could not at least think of two things at a time. With this brain, if you think one thing at a time, you're wasting the possibility of being human. Because there is so much friction in your head, now you think one thing itself is freaking me, if I think ten things, what will happen? No, no, you must geometrically bring some congruence into this. When I say geometry, you must understand all physical creation has a certain geometry. You understand what I'm saying? Hmm? Many of you are engineers, right? Hello? Yes. So, every physical form has a geometry. Without geometry, there's no physical existence. How congruent it is, how friction-free it is, determines how a particular formation of objects function. That goes for this, there is a physical geometry to this, there is a chemical geometry to this, there's an energetic geometry to this, there are various aspects of geometry. And our geometry is not individual. Our geometry is a consequence of the planetary system itself. Planetary system has worked as a potter's wheel to make this happen the way it is. If the planetary system worked some other way, we wouldn't be in this form, we would be in some other form, all right? So who we are right now is in congruence, but in how much congruence? is the question. So when you start thinking about future or planning for future, lot of people are telling you, don't think about tomorrow, don't think about yesterday, just be in the moment. Hmm? All read this stuff, this, this. I'm asking you, please be somewhere else and show me, please. Hello? Can you be somewhere else? Anyway you're in the moment, what kind of dumb teaching is that? Can you be somewhere else, you? Yes. You can be <laughs> All I mean is, uh, physically I'll be here and I'll be used to No, 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 no. It got you. You're here, but you're thinking, let's say, of Mumbai. What's wrong thinking about Mumbai? What's wrong planning to go to Mumbai? What's wrong planning to go to moon? Oh, I'm here. So I should not think about anything. What kind of dumb stuff is that? So unfortunately, this is passing off as spirituality. Generally, most people's understanding, understanding of spirituality is, it is a disability. If you say, I'm spiritual, first thing they'll ask you is, what are all the things you will not do? No, no, if you are spiritual, you can do any damn thing without getting entangled in anything. Full 360 degree life, I can do only this, that's not spiritual, that's a constipated life. If you are spiritual, you should be different. Anyway, coming to this process, it is very simple. See, you are who you are right now as a person. You have a certain amount of memory. You have memory. You as a person, you are this person only because of certain kind of memory. 
What is the difference between this person and this person? Oh, this is one kind of memory, this is another kind of memory, hmm? If both these people had exactly same memory, they would be the same chat GTP. <laughs> different kind of memory is what is making you different in experiences, different in opinions, different in everything. So there is a memory. Using this memory, we will run a certain imagination. Because we have a vivid sense of memory as human beings, our life feels rich. We remember every tiny little thing. Somebody smiled at us, somebody did some little act of love or kindness to us, little, little things, everything we remember because of this. If you didn't have this memory, you had just a vague sense of something, your life wouldn't be rich. So your life is rich essentially because of memory. But a whole lot of people suffer this memory immensely. You ask people, what are they suffering? What happened ten years ago, they're still suffering. What may happen day after tomorrow, they're already suffering. Because they don't understand, they're suffering their memory and imagination. They think they're suffering life. They're not suffering life, they're suffering their own memory and imagination. These two faculties of vivid sense of memory and fantastic sense of imagination is what sets a human being apart from every other creature on the planet. None of them have this kind of cerebral capability that they can remember all these things and make something else out of it. See, the boy wants to make uh, a cinema. What is that? Using your memory, you want to create a whole new world. Whatever you want to create, you're using your memory and seeing how to blow it up into something new, something bigger, something better than what is here right now. Now the problem is, you have no discipline. Your education systems have not made a distinction between what is memory and what is intelligence, unfortunately. So if you're sitting here, your memory spills over into this moment. If I look at you, my memory says, oh, he's okay, he's not okay, he's this, he's that, all this from previous memory. I'm not able to look at this human being just the way they are because my memory intervenes in everything. Once my memory intervenes, I can't control my imagination, what nonsense this person may do. But if you look at something, you must be able to look at it just for what it is, isn't it? Otherwise, you will miss life, you will just be recycling past. If you don't have this discipline, where is memory, where is imagination, where is the awareness of experience right now? If this distinction is not there, you will not live a life. You will just be a psychological case, but you think you're living a life. Your thought and emotion is not your life. This life is bigger than your thought. Hmm? This phenomenon of life is bigger than your thought, bigger than your emotion, bigger than your ideas, bigger than your silly imaginations, whatever you have. You throbbing here as life is bigger than all that, is that so? Is that so? In fact, that is the only thing you have in your life. Rest is all imagination. Have you ever been to your funeral? Somebody else's, not yours, no? <laughs> Somebody else's funeral, you've been? You know that man is in perfect posture. You go and tell him, you know you hit a lottery, hundred crores. The guy's not interested. You tell him, this woman, most beautiful woman on the planet that you wanted, she's right here for you. Not interested. They found a lump of gold in your house, not interested. Tell him whatever for which he was hopping around all these days, not interested. What happened to this guy? Only thing that he lost is life and suddenly everything else is nothing. Why? Because all the time this is the only damn thing you have, you're alive. Rest is all your imagination. You're misunderstanding your imagination and memory as life process. No, it can add substance to your life, it cannot be life. Life is happening now, you're throbbing alive. If you don't throb alive, your memory and imagination can be stored today in your computer or somewhere else or you can create your own avatar, but still you will not experience it. So the distinction between memory 
awareness of life and imagination is not there because education systems are such a scramble. They were all essentially made to fit you into an economic engine which is running this whole world. You're just another cog. If you don't function as the little cog that you're supposed to function, somebody will crush you or something will crush you. So this is important that today we're reaching a place in the world where in another fifteen years, maybe twenty years time, there may be universal income. That is, nobody has to work for their bread. Don't think this is a small thing. For ten, fifteen, twenty-five, forty, fifty thousand years ago or hundred thousand years, human beings have toiled for bread. Hmm? Yes or no? Yes. Toil means you don't understand in today's life. You just do rupee and they give you, Swiggy Piggy delivers you in your room. <laughs> Not that. If you lived in the wild, you have to toil daily for your food. If you have to do agriculture, grow your own food, you have to toil for food endlessly, ceaselessly, every day, every day. To get a bucket full of water, you have to walk miles. This is how life has been. So for this entire history of humanity, human beings largely have spent their time trying to get their bread together. But we are coming to a time in your generation, we are coming to a time where bread will be free universally, almost for everybody on the planet. We are coming close, at least in most nations. Unfortunately, a few nations have slipped out of that possibility. But most nations will have universal income. That means you don't have to work for your bread. But once you don't have to work for your bread, in my understanding of how people's mindset is right now, about forty percent will sink into chemical usage, alcohol, various other things because they can't handle it. If there is no survival instinct active, how to be? They don't know. Like if you don't have an examination which is survival, <laughs> you don't know how to be. This is important. This is a time where everybody has to learn how to be because what you do with your intellect, a machine can do better than you. See, there was a time Man thought his muscle is everything. Machines came. What thousand men can do, one machine is doing. Suddenly man's muscle is not important. All the ladies, I want you to understand, today you're able to do what men are generally doing in the world and the same level of capacity simply because of machines and technology, not because of some liberation that you did. If man's muscle was important force on the planet, Still it would be the same thing, isn't it? So there was a time if you had really big muscles, we would make you the king of Bengaluru. Today we may hire you as a security guy <laughs> at the most. That also it may not happen just because of your muscle. There also we ask how much brain do you have. So man's muscle became irrelevant in the last century because of technology and machines that we built. Now. All the intellectual coolies are worrying what will happen to us if these machines store all the data and do all the process that we are doing and acting funny in the world. When I say acting funny, if you read three books, you can become a school teacher. If you read ten books, you can be. I'm sorry if I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't mean an insult. If you read ten books, you can become a professor in a university. If you read just one book, you can claim you're the agent of God. This is the world you're living in, this has to change. Because the phone that you carry has more memory than all the people put, here, put together here. So machines, once they start doing collection of data, process and expression, which they will do far more efficiently on a larger scale than you, then what to do with myself? No need to earn my living, no need to collect data, what to do? You must know, now you must prepare, otherwise you'll be obsolete in no time. It's very, very important. So you must first learn how to be. This is one thing the machine cannot do, how to be. 
See, you must understand your basic qualification is this. Your basic qualification is not MBA. First thing is we call you HB, human being. We didn't call any other creature on this planet as a being. We didn't call a tiger a tiger being, an elephant an elephant being, an ant an ant being. Only you, we call you a being because you are supposed to know how to be. That means you are not an instinctive, compulsive reaction to world around you. Whatever is happening around you, you can choose how to be. If you do not exercise this, then your memory is a problem, your imagination is a problem, this is a problem, that is a problem, everything is a problem. Tell me what is not a problem in the world. See, if you don't get admission into kindergarten, I couldn't go to school and you will suffer. You put you to school, see how much suffering <laughs> No job, you'll suffer. Get your job, so much suffering, people are getting blood pressure and killing themselves in the jobs. Poor people suffer poverty. You make them rich, they suffer taxes, they're breaking their heads about the taxes. Not married, they suffer that. Get them married, I didn't say anything. I did not say anything, okay. So tell me one damn thing that human beings are not suffering. So the suffering is not in life. It's up to you how you use your intelligence. Whether you know how to be or you don't know how to be. If you know how to be, would you be blissful or miserable? Choose. Blissful, of course. If you're blissful, whatever the situation, what is the problem? We will do what we can do. What we cannot do, we won't do. Hello? What we can do, we'll definitely do. What we cannot do, we won't do. But human potential can be explored only when these two situations happen. You know how to be and there's no concern about bread. That time is coming. Please get ready and create something wonderful on this planet. Don't become one of those slobs who'll sink into this and that nonsense. They are expecting, some of the scientists, responsible scientists in the world, I've been talking to a whole lot of neuroscientists, psychiatrists and others, they're all expecting somewhere between 2045 to 2055, twenty percent of the world's population could commit suicide. It'll become that hard to live for a variety of reasons, I, let me not go into all that. One aspect is nutritional aspect, another aspect is this that your survival instinct is not on, you have no examination to take, nobody to fight with, don't have to go somewhere to get your bread. Bread comes home, now you don't know what to do and you don't know how to be. If you do not know how to be, this wonderful time that's coming, which no human generation has ever enjoyed, that we don't have to work for our bread, that situation will go waste. They're expecting forty percent of the people will go into alcohol and drugs, twenty percent could commit suicide, another ten, fifteen percent will be insane in so many ways. Ten, fifteen percent may start doing something fantastic because their genius will flower, because they have… don't have to earn their bread, they can use their intelligence from an early age into creating something. I want to make sure we increase that percentage at least to fifty percent of the human beings will be doing something fantastic. I think we'll take one or uh, two last questions. Can you uh, give the mic here? Right now in India they're making an experiment. I think it's a CBS here, now all their schools, open book examination. You heard about that? Oh, I would allow it, but you won't like it because there'll be no struggle. <laughs> Namaste Sadhguru. My question is quite simple. Uh, do you believe in the concept of fate or destiny? Why should I… why should I believe in your concept? <laughs> My concept, generally. Should we believe in the concept of fate or destiny? Say, uh, Destiny essentially means, uh, people are imagining there is a fixed destination that you may get to no matter what, yes? 
There's a fixed destination. Any way you're going to get there, no matter what. Try this, no? Today you do one thing. What do you drive? A car, a motorcycle, what? Car. You want to go home. Close your eyes, any way your home is your destination. <laughs> I will get you an astrologer who will tell you, you will live to be eighty or eighty-five, whatever. Definitely you will live very well with your wife and children and whatever else you have in your life. Everything will be fantastic, I'll get all the predictions. Just drive your car with eyes closed. Let's see how far you get. I think we know where to pick you up. <laughs> and on the way, many other unfortunate <laughs> people <laughs> also. So only because you open your eyes and drive carefully, you may get home. There's no guarantee. Hello? Just because I'm a good driver, there is no guarantee I'm going to definitely get home. I may get home, I want to make sure I get home, that's a different matter, but there is no guarantee. Anybody has come here with a guarantee card? There's no such thing. So, destiny and fate, these are all engagements for vain minds who don't want to strive to create anything. They think somebody has fixed it and it's going to happen. This will destroy all human potential. All this, Unfortunately, you're blaming it on usually that Partha Sarathi. <laughs> See, please understand the man is holding rein reins of the chariot in his hands. A man who believes this chariot will anyway go wherever it has to go, will he hold it and manage it? That means he's holding the steering wheel, yes or no? And he doesn't trust the other fools will drive well. That's why he himself is standing and he wants to drive it. You think he's telling you it's your destiny? The entire thing is just this. This fool believes he's going to win the war. He's telling him there is no such thing. Anybody can win the war. Anybody can get killed. In the first moment you're on the battlefield, you could get killed. You may be a great hero. One moment if you're not alert, you'll be dead. He's saying you do what you have to do to the best ability that you can, what will happen will happen. This is the nature of life. But because you do not know how to handle tomorrow, because you don't have a plan, nor do you have the commitment to fulfill that plan, you want a divine plan for yourself. Hmm? God's plan essentially, destiny, fate means God's plan. What the hell makes you think? If there is a god sitting up there, where, is, where do you think he is? Up or down? Huh? Inside. Inside. Then you must do the planning and you must do the execution <laughs> If he's inside, no problem. There's a god inside of you? So let me settle this <laughs> Because in this body, for any of you, in this body, is there only one person or two or three or whatever? Anybody more than one? If you have more than one, you're either schizophrenic or you're possessed. <laughs> you either need a psychiatrist or a exorcist. Both need to be handled. <laughs> this is a being, we call this an individual. You know why? Because it's not further divisible. The moment you think this is two, your sickness has begun. You see, this is just one being. And now, if this is joyful, it's me. If it's miserable, it's me. If I get there, it's me. If I don't get there, it's me. This way you're empowered. If you think if I get there, I did it, otherwise it's my fate. Well, you have found a philosophy to sit on your backside comfortably and eat. But you have not found a way to trigger this life to the maximum possibility that it can be. You don't wish to do all those things, it's fine. But at least what you want must happen, isn't it? You give that up because you think it's not your destiny or your… this is your fate. This is just an explanation. See, people who fail in their life, they always have explanations. People who are successful, they have no explanation because they know it's endless striving. Endless striving. 
there's simply no other way. So, uh, this process of what is destiny and what you do, what you do not do, can I tell you a little story? Can I tell a school story, it's okay. A young… A, an Indian family in United States, they had a little boy who was like eight-year-old boy, but you know Indian families, education, education. <laughs> because two, three or five, ten generations of people have suffered poverty, uh, at least this generation is still cooling off, but otherwise our parents' generation, like always education, education, if you don't educate, what will happen? That thing, wherever they go, the same thing. So the child is studying, he's doing very well, but in mathematics he's only getting ninety-five. <laughs> the mother and father are so worried, what is happening to the other five marks? So they want to put him in a, another school where mathematics is supposed to be best. So he was in a public school, from there they moved him into a, a Catholic-run school. So he went there, within three months, the boy started getting hundred out of hundred, hundred out of hundred. Then they asked one day, who is your math teacher? We want to meet this teacher. They've done miracles for you. He said, no, no, it's not math teacher. Then what is it? It's just that when I go to the school, I see a man is nailed to a plus mark. I don't want to get there, so I'm doing my best. <laughs> you got it? So sometimes you have to be nailed to move, don't do that. Nobody should whip you, no situation should whip you for you to be in full force. You must be in full force. This you will only do if you are joyful and exuberant by your own nature. Only when you're joyful, you're willing to go on full on, isn't it? Little frustration, little de depression, little something then you think, then maybe this is my fate. No, that's not your fate. You're finding an explanation for your lethargy. You're finding an explanation for your failure. Never find an explanation for your failure, you just say, okay, I failed. Maybe, I don't want to succeed. You just say, I don't want to succeed. Within three days, everything within you craves for success. If you say, I did not succeed because stars are in, not in place, goddamn stars don't even know you exist. <laughs> and many of those stars that you see don't exist, they died long time ago, but they're determining your future. Not a good way to do things. So, I am from PGPEM and this is a program which uh, gives us an MBA for working professionals. So, we have to work as well as we study and both are inevitable. Uh, like. So, I find it a bit challenging to switch between topics like we have to finish our work and then we have to study also in a day. So, uh, what, what do you suggest or what is the solution to this? It's very challenging to switch, the mental switching is challenging. See, uh, instead of thinking in terms of study, why don't you think in terms of learning? You, you're here to learn. You're not here to study. You're not here to pass examinations. You're here to learn. Hello? This is an institute of learning, isn't it? So you need to change that context, you're here to learn. Can you do your work well if you're not constantly learning, I'm asking? Whatever you're doing. Whatever it is you're doing, you're just repairing a bicycle. Can you do it well if you're not constantly learning? This is a simple thing or complex thing. You must be endlessly learning, that's when you do those things well, isn't it? If this being in this institute is about learning, working, learning will support working. But now studying, this is labor. To do that labor and also work, which is another labor, no. You should not work in this life, don't work. Do what you want to do, hello? Do what really matters to you. When you're doing what matters to you, nothing is burdensome. If you're given forty-eight hours a day, you want it. Right now there's an argument in the country, should we work thirty-six hours a week? And 
one of the very successful Bangaloreans said, seventy hours a week, everybody is protesting. I said, why only seventy hours? <laughs> if you are doing something that you really love to do, why will you want to do it only seventy hours? If you are TGIF, <laughs> then you are constantly thinking how to do less. See, this is the unfortunate reality of the marketplace which has entered every aspect of our life. If you go out to buy vegetables today, if you buy hundred rupees worth of whatever, let's say a pumpkin, for eighty rupees and come, people say you're smart. You paid less, you gave less and took more. This is being smart, isn't it? But if you go somewhere and give more, and get less, people think you're stupid, correct? But you must understand the dynamic of life. In this life, your life will become truly rich when you're willing to throw yourself into anything that you're doing and you don't care what comes out of it, you're not even… you're not even focused on that. You're just devoted to what you're doing. What comes will come depending on the quality of what we do. But you're not concerned about that, you're concerned that life is giving you an opportunity to do what you want to do, that's important. What you get, what will you do with it? You want to carry it on your head? This nonsense is only socially relevant, it's not relevant. See, right now, what is my bank balance? I have a million dollars. Where is it? It's only in your imagination, if I just take your memory out, I don't have to steal your million dollars. If I take your memory out, your million dollars are gone. Whole lot of people who kept their money in Swiss banks, this happened to them. They were writing their numbers in their underwears, but when the underwear is lost <laughs> We know people like that, they were writing numbers in their underwear, because that's the only place where nobody will see. But one day that got lost. Now all the money is lost simply because you don't remember the number. I'm saying whatever you think you have is not the point. The only thing that you have is in your life is just this. Please look at this very carefully. How profound is your experience of life? How impactful is your activity? This is all you have, rest is all imagination. So in every moment of your life, whatever you're doing, how to make this a profound experience? See, any simple thing, you don't have to do something very complex. Like a little boy, yesterday I was at the cricket game, uh, the, the ladies' game that was, you know, the IPL is happening, the women's IPL. So I was invited, so I went there, I was just looking at this and I was just talking, these girls, uh, what is the minimum age for them to enter this? They said, no, they must be eighteen, whatever. But, you know, Sachil Tendulkar was playing test match at sixteen. Oh, those days are gone, now there are this, this, this. I said, why are they gone? See, this little boy, I've, I've sat with him and spoken to him. What did he do? This little boy just wants to hit the ball, hit the ball, hit the ball. He's not thinking of the money, he's not thinking of the fame, he's not thinking how to become a Bharat Ratna, all right? He's just hitting the ball, hitting the ball, absolute devotion to hitting the ball. I don't want to go into many stories, there's spectacular stories about him, how he did a few things. But he hit the ball so well in the end that we made him Bharat Ratna. Just for hitting a stupid ball? Yes, it doesn't matter how simple the activity, if you do it in an extraordinary way, you will be the jewel of this nation, all right? So, as we come towards the end of today's interaction, I extend a heartfelt gratitude to Sadhguru for being with us here today. Your words and thoughts have resonated with us and we are just grateful for this wonderful interaction. Thank you.